Hello and welcome back to another EDH deck video. Uh, this is going to be a two-part video where I am going to be opening and chatting about the Peer Through Time 2014 Constructed Precon. The second video I have a stack of singles from the same set, uh, artifacts and lands and whatnot, to help improve this. And I'll be talking about uh, kind of some general hints and strategies for newer players to EDH, how to improve and design a deck when starting with a precon. Um, so this 2014 set, there is of course five of each type. Um, well, they did mono color this time. Uh, they have uh, the built from scratch mono red and mono green, mono white, blue, and dark or black. <laughs> um, if you are new to EDH, I would honestly not suggest this. Um, really, the only reason people are actively searching for these is if they just don't know what's in them. Uh, the only actual valuable card in all of the set right now is the, uh, well, at date, is the, uh, the white card that, um, Containment Priest. Um, everything else, like the actual valuable cards, there's just not a lot. And, uh, Commander didn't, didn't actually print a whole bunch of exclusive must-haves this time around. There's a lot of really clever cards, like a Geralt there's nice. Um, there's some fun new mechanics, like the, um, Lieutenant Effects. But uh, this time around, there's just not a whole bunch. And monocolor decks, for new players to EDH, I, I need to reemphasize this. I would not suggest starting with monocolor because you're restricting yourself a whole bunch. The Bant one from last year with uh, Dervi is actually a very good starting place because in Bant you have white for uh, wrath effect, green for ramp, blue for draw. Bant is really strong in EDH, and that's a good starting place. And they're very cheap. Um, but this one right here, um, there's just not actually, I don't think, any money cards in this this entire box. I was able to trade for this one very cheap. Um, you can still buy these brand new for 30. Um, and the stack of cards I have over here is essentially the exact amount that this should be. I think it actually is cheaper. Um, the only valuable card in here is Teferi that's also not even seeing a lot of play. Uh, the Singleton Teferi, I think, is like $6, if that, at the state. Um, let's go ahead and open this up. So the... Uh, Every Commander product, they've had these fancy little boxes. They also come with little boxes inside. Let's go ahead and get to it. Um, they also, this one's giving us a new set of tokens. These double-sided tokens, which are pretty fancy. And um, while they do give us a Jumbo Teferi, I'm actually a little upset because I, I love Lorthos, and I also like some of the other legendaries they printed here. Um, the only Jumbo card that we get is the Singleton Planeswalker. So let's get him out of here. But Teferi, if you aren't familiar with this um, old character from the old storyline, there we go. I bumped my camera. Now, Teferi is uh, basically the guy who was stuck in a time shift or a time flux for a while. He aged a little bit. He was friends with uh, um, Jehora and Karn and whatnot. A, his normal card is much, much better than this. The normal card giving thing, himself having flash and making everything essentially sorcery speed is great. Right here, we just have a generic planeswalker like it his abilities are so and just generic it just doesn't feel very exciting the ability to untap for permanence is his negative one ability is probably the only reason anyone would ever run this which means he could technically act as either acceleration um he can be basically keep your your counter magic open the ultimate is interesting but if he is your general, then really there's not enough planeswalkers to make use of that. You're talking about Karn and maybe Ujin here, um, and maybe one of the Jaces if you're going for it. But you're also in a call or mono blue that you can't tutor those up. So as a general, I mean he's just generic good stuff, and there's a lot more generic good stuff mono blue generals you could run. Um, let's get them out of the way and go on to this. Now uh, these are. Uh, last year's uh, boxes were fantastic, 2013, because they held everything, including the the jumbo generals in here, perfectly. Uh, they had a removable bit and everything. The new ones, although, are not not as big, and because they are not as big, they actually don't hold everything as smoothly. Uh, that's another downside I am not so happy with. Um, so here's the fun little box. Again, the last year one you could pull these out as well, and they could hold essentially two sets of cards back to back like this. Um, but the last year's model were just ever so slightly bigger. And just because they were bigger meant you could have the sleeved cards in there too. If you were to sleeve this deck, you would not be able to keep it in this box unless you took that inner part out. Um, we have the general pullouts here. This is not really interesting. 
basically just a big, I, I recall they have a back history of, let's do it here. We have a back history of all the creatures, or the, the main ones. Like a little rundown of Stitcher is always nice. I really like the flavor of Stitcher's card when we get to it. I'll show you more of the artwork. Um, and then there's, of course, a complete list in the back and, and ideas for how to play the deck. Um, I would not suggest bothering too much with that because ideally when you get this, as you see in my second video, there's options for lots and lots of customization and changing. I'm going to go through the deck here and talk about the cards and the impact some of these are having on EDH as a format, like the actual health of the format. Um, kind of probably going to rant a little bit about development pushing specific things. But the second video will be more about actually ways of improving this deck, and ways to actually run this, some strategies and optimizations, and even a chatter of politics. Um, so there is the emblem that goes with Teferi. Oh, his emblem, by the way. I'll probably get back to it. Let's go ahead and run through his abilities. Um, six mana planeswalker starts at five loyalty plus one as you look at the top two and put one in your hand and one in the bottom. So it is a nice draw machine. If you have a super friends deck, you might as well run him just to get the extra draw. He undoes, have the uh, middle ability there to untap four permanents. That also means he could untap Chain Veil and Mana Accelerant. So you could technically use him to go infinite or use other Planeswalker abilities until he kills himself. The emblem gives you the ability to use your loyalties from all your Planeswalkers anytime you can cast an instant, including the other player's turns. That's, that's this card right here. Again, if he's your general, you don't have a lot to choose from. But if you're also using that ability for Super Friends, that's not fast enough for Super Friends. But like I, if you look at my decks, you'll see, or my videos, you'll see I have a Krosis Super Friends deck. I never had to ferry out for more than two or three turns before I either lost or he got killed or I've won. Like he, there's just no chance he's ever going to get to that ultimate before he's you're done or he's done. <laughs> Um, now, what Wizards are doing now, re or development, they are actually making two-faced tokens. Uh, this is, I like this concept, this is nice. The commercials, the advertisements on the back of the normal tokens drive me up the wall, because if Wizards actually takes a poll, they'll see no one actually ever reads that. Um, if there isn't actually one from development right now, I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, while this is a nice improvement, this is not perfect. You know what's perfect? Having a token that has the magic artwork on the back. If you are an elitist or any kind of collector, then you know that this token right here has value because it has this on the back. If you go through and just look at all the generic tokens like Sliver Token, well, Sliver Tokens are a bad example. Any of the older tokens, like the original Legion zombie tokens or goblins, for example, they, the magic artwork on the back ones are considered the best. And it wouldn't, like if, if Wizards even wants to sell a product, they could probably go through and uh, make a token set. And if they actually had magic artwork on the back, I'm sure people would buy the shit out of that. I know I would. Um, so we have the emblem there. Um, these guys are probably my favorite part. Like, the, this is the only card I was actively excited about when I read this deck. Um, there's a dude that makes this guy, and if you look in the artwork of each one, uh, the creature, I'll, I'll pull it out here, but essentially, you know, let's just wait till I get the creature. Um, but the ability to make multiples of these is just so funny. Um, he's just great. And on the back of each one, there's the zombie tokens for Giroff. There's lots of those. That's a good thing. Uh, we have a monkey token, or an ape token for the one removal, and some more zombie tokens. And some land. Lots and lots of basics. The bad thing, again, if you look at the complete deck list, this deck has 40 or 41 basic lands and a few artifact accelerants. So this is essentially designed for a very slow meta. Very slow games. Um, when I get to the next video, you see me improving the land base. Um, well, not improving the land base. Well, tweaking a little bit. Um, but 40 to 41 basics with Artifact Accelerant, which is in the deck, that's way too much. You're going to get flooded at some times. And if you just improve some of those lands with like 1 to 2 mana costing Accelerants, then you have drastically improved the speed of the deck. So we have Tafari. As a possible General Giroff. I love what they did with this character. If you actually look in the artwork, you have... His assistant, you have uh, Corpse or Grim Grin, you have Giraffe. This is the sister of Gisa uh, from the Innistrad block. Fantastic flavor. I love what they did with this card. I've built a deck with him already. If you want to know what I did in that deck, look at my Rock Amar deck with all the untapped shenanigans. Um, that's exactly what he needs. If you can start activating his ability or making copies of his ability and untapping him with the intruder alarm enchantment so he auto untaps himself when his token enters, you can have lots of fun with this guy. 
Um, the one I'm actually interested in is, of course, Lorathos. I'm going to chatter about this more in the next video, but I like generals that either have activated abilities, but I've already played with that, or something that actually dictates a win condition. Tafari does not activate a, or dictate a win condition. He is, I guess, a, a route to that, I suppose, in control. Um, but I like the giant spaghetti monster, uh, the theme of eight and whatnot. So those are the generals this deck came with. Uh, let's keep on going. I have no idea what order this is put into, um, but here's a couple of the new cards. The Dulcet Sirens is nifty for politics. You would usually think this would be uh, red or white, something you could fit in a Passandra deck, but I like what they do with this card. Um, this is the card that goes with the uh, Clever Tokens, that uh, when this particular one dies, you get a 3-3, three, three, a 6-6, six, six, and a 9-9. Nine, nine. Again, this is, the, this is the only reason I really wanted a new mint one of these for my own collection. Uh, this is funny, of course, with uh, token copy effects like uh, you know, Parallel Lives, is that right? Or it might be uh, Doubling Season or both, I don't remember which one. But um, the flavor behind this card, this is hilarious. I love this card. Uh, now we have our new reprint of Ixodron, the one that a lot of people hate seeing because it, now without Tuck, this essentially is a great way of nerfing a general. We have a new one, the Lieutenant effects are really cute. Essentially, oh, come on focus now camera. But uh, what the Lieutenant effects do is they will, uh, essentially if you have your general out, give you a, a better effect. So this one right here is, it gets plus two plus two and it has an ability of drawing two cards if it were to be blocked. That's nice. We have a reprint of Frostite. Oh, my camera's not focusing at all. Hmm. I don't know what the auto... It might be the face in the background. Let me do this. Anyways, we have a reprint of Frost Titan. It's a generic Titan. It's a good Titan. I would prefer just about any other Titan over this. A reprint of Sphinx of Jar Isle. And the Magosi. I like this one for drawing cards. He tends to get really big. Uh, Phyrexian Ingester is really good removal. Blana Blue has a hard time for removal. Usually it's some shitty enchantment. Uh, but this is actually really good because you're also in the color of blinking. Uh, talking about blinking, we have uh, the uh, Factor Fiction on a Creature. I love this card. If you've seen my blue videos, you know I tend to put them in there. Overguard Swift Sweeps is uh, overcosted for bounce two. I suppose it's okay. Now we have another new one, which is a Breaching Leviathan. When it comes in, if you cast it from your hand, you tap on non-blues and they skip the untap of those. And another one is the Deep Sea Crack, and this one is a reprint from Time Spiral, I believe. Really big dude. <laughs> Infinite Reflections is a cute card that, if you have an aggressive creature on the battlefield, like one of your Krakens, um, all your creatures become that. If you have something that enters the battlefield and draws you, or has some enter the battlefield trigger, every single card you cast as a creature will have that ability. Uh, here's a new one that essentially gives you a whole bunch of draw. This is a pol not really pol political card. This is more for a uh, Nekasar deck where you want to draw more cards, but you still want to have a draw effect out to burn everyone. Uh, another printing of Cyclonic Rift is great. Cackling Counterpart confuses people because they always think you can target anything. It has to be your own creature. <laughs> Domineering Will is another new card. I really like this one. Um, instant speed combat shenanigans in mono blue are great. I love the... Uh, just taking people's stuff and, and whatnot. So I'm, obviously I love active treason effects. And this one, preventing or, or forcing whatnot, is it's just great. Um, <laughs> Intellectual Offering is another one of those political cards. This probably won't be something I'll be running. Uh, Stroke of Genius is, I guess, the poor man's version of the uh, Blue Sun Zenith. Still instant speed and targets any player. It's essentially the same thing as Blue Sun Zenith, but it goes to your graveyard. Uh, right of Replication is a fantastic win condition. Um, Aether Gale is a new one. I think it's new. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's new. We just returned six non-land permanents to own his hand. Five mana for six removal was okay. Distortion Wake is definitely an old one because you're seeing the uh, weather light there, but uh, old X bounce spell. I really don't like this one. If this were an instant, I would be tempted to actually run it in the main deck. Eh. Now this is the actual... This has always got me a little odd because I don't see why this is in the mono blue deck. I understand why the mono red deck got the worm coil engine, but this one doesn't make a whole bunch of sense for mono blue. Yeah. Uh, we have a reprint of the medallion series. I really love these. Uh, I think they were from Tempest. That sounds about right. Um, but each color has one of these. It's a fantastic effect. It's accelerant that you don't have to tap. Essentially just cost it, making everything cost one less. If you want your cancel to be a counter spell, then you got it with this. Crown of Doom is a new political card. This is really funny where you can just donate it. I would assume this is going to end up in a whole bunch of 
well, just about any aggro rush deck, really. Um, even um, the the female goat one from the original Commander series could run this, I suppose. Uh, Nerval's Disc. <laughs> Again, this is a strange one to see in this design. I suppose it's more for control. Uh, I would have supposed this would have been in the mono red one for the artifact shenanigans, but they had to give blue something, I guess. Now we have all these lands. Um, it was interesting they gave us the crew lands, the original ones. Uh, the, the problem is a lot of people who are picking up this pre-con are not reading all the cards, so they don't actually read that you have to bounce an untapped island, and pointing that out makes them unhappy because setting them back lands like this land specifically is, is grumpy, but bounce lands in general, if your meta has no land destruction, then sure, go for it. Uh, people will say that this is card advantage. I don't believe that, it, because when you play this, you're getting a card back to your hand, and this does, while you're making your land drops, it technically taps for the same amount of mana you would technically have, even though it comes to play tapped. But people claim that this is card advantage because you bounce a land, yeah, you just wait till you get strip mined, then go ahead and tell me again how awesome this, these cards are. The Ghost Quarter is for non-basic removal. I like this one. Uh, a little bit of cycling. I love this card. As soon as this was printed, I pre-ordered a shit ton of them. This is in almost all my mono red decks for reasons. Uh, another cycling. Tech Edge. And Zodic Cavern. There's a little morph theme coming up. Um, this is probably one of the few morph cards that we'll, I'll probably keep in the deck in the next video. Because it is technically land acceleration. We have a couple older cards here. Zero Mage, everyone likes the artwork. But a non-tap, just pay to draw is always good. Fathom Seer is a little morph. I'm probably not going to keep morphing by bouncing islands. It, technically in a competitive environment. Bouncing islands to gush and whatnot it sounds great. Just to draw two cards, and I don't think that's really worth it. Uh, Fog Bank for defense. And Willbender, that's the one morph card that is obviously going to stay in the deck. It's the only morph card you would honestly be able to probably guess and get right in a normal EDH environment. <laughs> a, another morph where you can shuffle, or not shuffle, um, just dig through a couple cards. Seagate Oracle helps you get something to your hand. Another morph where you can do a little bit of combat shenanigans. Again, this is probably not going to stay in the deck. Mall Drifter, everyone likes Mall Drifter. Brian Elemental. This is another morph card I'm probably not going to run because of the threat of Pickles Lock. If you're not familiar with what that is, uh, when you get a, a uh, clone type creature like the clone that morphs, um, you can go essentially prevent everyone from ever having an untapped step where they are unable to just keep untapping their permanence. It's called Pickles Lock. This and what is it? The uh, Vesuvian Doppelganger. No, wait, that's the old one. Whatever the morph uh, clone is and this one go together, it's so noxious. But at the same time, it's just a two-card combo, so it's it's pretty decent. It just me. Uh, this is a little bit of reanimation in blue, which is strange. You can put this on just about anything except someone's commander. We well, could put it on the commander, but you're probably not going to get it. Uh, Pognify is blue removal. I really like this <laughs> making monkeys. It's a shame they didn't put the other one, a rapid hybridization, in here too. Recoil is our potential bounce and draw. Uh, we have another combat trick for red. This is kind of what red gets for removal if someone were to block or if you're playing with a 2-2. The flavor text here is fantastic, just saying rivet. <laughs> uh, exclude is a creature counter and draw. I like things that draw. Dismiss including. I do run dismiss in my favorite mono blue deck or blue black deck. Exclude is an interesting one. I'll probably keep it in here. It's it's okay. Call to mind is a nice recovery just to get that right of replication back so you can do it again. A little bit of draw and filtering. More hard draw. Again, I wish this was the instant version, like a, what is it, Jace's Ingenuity or um, Opportunity, for example, would have been much better than this. Granted, they cost different, but it's per preference, really. Um, I think Tidings actually would have been better, too. Being that this deck has lots of big, beefy creatures, and I plan on running the Lorothos as my general, I hope this plans out. This could literally be drawing eight cards if I have Lorothos on the battlefield, and that sounds great. <laughs> Another big beefy uh, reanimation guy. Another mana thing. The one thing that I'm going to have to focus on if running Lorthos is getting all the mana in the world. And this is going to help. A little graveyard hate. It wouldn't be EDH without Soul Ring. One of my favorite mana rocks because I like things that can sack themselves. If a Bane of Progress is going to help, it's nice to go ahead and just get rid of what you have. Uh, Sky Diamond. I love my diamonds. Shame it's not a 7th edition foily one, but I mean, this artwork is fantastic. Boots for Lorthos. The Commander's Fear is the same thing as the Mind Stone, it's just you don't have to pay to activate, but it taps for color, one colorless, it'll tap for blue, and it costs one more. 
Again, things I can sacrifice if all artifacts are going to be destroyed, I can gain some advantage here. A mono blue or just a removal effect, I suppose. It's very expensive to activate. It's like a Spine of Ishaw. I would prefer to have Spine of Ishaw, actually, which is going to be in the side coming up here. <laughs> More artifact ramp. Assault suit is hilarious. The problem is at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, I may have them gain control. I am not my own opponent. I won't be able to get this guy back. and I think I'm doing that right. Because if I send it off to the opponent, I can't get it back. Um, what I would have enjoyed seeing is a forced attack. A, ta a target creature or equipped creature has to attack every turn. Because this would have made uh, Roxas the Defiler hilarious. <laughs> um, artifact ramp, artifact ramp, and artifact ramp. So that is the uh, pre-con for Peer Through Time. And these are the three generals that you could potentially run. Again, this is this is probably not one of the best ones. If you're interested in getting a pre-con, I would suggest digging up one of the three color pre-cons from last year. Um, they are still wildly available. The only hard one to get is Mind Seas because of the stupid Merfolk. The Bant one is highly playable and it's very easy to upgrade and improve a Bant deck. Um, this year's, the only one worth buying or actively searching is the mono white one, so you can get Containment Priest. The mono red one has some value because you get a Worm Coil Engine, but to be honest, I don't think that's enough value to warrant a purchase. Doretti is not so good on zone. Um, a lot of people thought it was going to be a fantastic general. I don't think that style of attrition is good enough. I, like it, I guess in casual metas it's fine. Um, unless your deck is very under... Unless your opponents are just very underwhelming, or I would not actually think Tafari himself as a general is going to be a, a good one, unless you just have a super flavor love for him. I mean, his story is fantastic there. Um, Stitcher is fantastic also, but that's not, there's not enough in what these cards pool I have here. Um, again, I'm doing my self restriction with 2014 only. There's not enough to make him functional. Um, oh, good, I suppose. If you like what he does, I would definitely check out my Rakamar deck. There's lots of artifact support and untap and double effect shenanigans. Since you're in blue, again, you have untap effects. You have things like Fate Stitcher, you have Intruder Alarm. Lots of ways of doing fun things here. My preference, what the next video is going to be about, is constructing around Lorthos. Um, flavorfully, this is hilarious. <laughs> again, this is a big, gigantic creature. He's not competitive due to his size, and I do play multiplayer. Lorothos in 1v1, yeah, if you can get him, if you get that activated ability to happen just once in 1v1, there's no way you're going to lose. Because, well, I suppose it, the odd chance of a hexproof general about to kill you. But, I mean, tapping down eight of the opponent's permanents when he is declared... And that means you essentially just time walk and globe trot all over the opponent. Multiplayer, I'm going to have to get into this in the next video, but a multiplayer with Lorthos is going to be interesting. You'll have to employ a lot of politics and play smartly. Um, but yeah, this is the 2014 peer through time. Probably going to have a giant pile of cards to trade here shortly, simply because I got a giant pile of cards to improve this deck with. I will go ahead and sleeve this up. I have some of my super ghetto rook <laughs> purple sleeves. These things feel funny. It's just they're old. I miss rook. I hope they make come. They're not going to come back. They got bankrupt because they're just not enough. There's too much competition, but some of their products are still fantastic. They're just getting harder to find. Um, but yeah, if you had any ideas, if you had any fun playing this pre-con, definitely let me know. Usually the best time to play the pre-con is against other pre-cons, though. <laughs>